Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 363. Today's big Bible question is an honestly very controversial one. Did Jesus claim to be the only way to be saved? Well, hello, friends. Happy Christmas Eve to all of you. No matter what your circumstance right now, whether you are mourning the death of a loved one, battling COVID, fighting anxiety, going through extreme health issues or financial issues or relational issues or some other trial, the good news of Christmas is that God sent his son to save. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but Jesus comes that we might have abundant life in him. In this world, you and I are going to have tribulation, but we must take courage because Jesus has overcome the world, says John 16, 33. Today, We will be reading 2 Chronicles 29, Zechariah 11, John 14, and Revelation 15. Welcome aboard to new listeners in France, Bihar, India, Monterey, California, and San Francisco, California. Today we're going to revisit a topic we've already covered, but it's been, I think, since March of this year. And we're going to do it in a very fresh way, of course. Did Jesus claim to be the only way to be saved? Put another way, did Jesus claim to be the only way to heaven and eternal life with the Father? Well, let's read our John 14 passage and find out what exactly Jesus did claim. John 14, chapter 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may also be. You know the way to where I am going. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Lord said, Philip, show us the Father, and that's enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been among you all this time, and you do not know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who lives in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and he will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You will live too. On that day, you will know that I am in the Father You are in me, and I am in you. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me, and the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and will reveal myself to him. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. The one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. The words that you hear... The word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. You have heard me tell you I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you may believe. I will not talk with you much longer, because the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me. On the contrary, so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do as the Father commanded me. Get up, let's leave this place. So I find John 14 verses 6 and 7 to be one of the more important passages in the whole Bible. Jesus says in verse 6, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So I used that passage as my high school yearbook quote, even when I wasn't really following God in a particularly strong way. And even though I was kind of a clueless 18, whatever, 19 year old, I could tell that this passage packed some major truth. Two big things we we see Jesus saying here. Number one, he's the only way to the Father. Number two, if you know Jesus and if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father, which strikes me as yet another claim by him to Godhead. So we're living in an interesting time. A couple of years ago, I read a quote from a pastor named John who, uh, Shuck, who was in Beaverton, Oregon. He said this, I'm going to read the quote word for word. Someone quipped to me that my congregation is bring your own God. I use that and invite people to bring their own God or none at all. While the symbol, quote, God is part of our cultural tradition, you can take it or leave it or redefine it to your liking. The concept of God is a product of myth-making, and God is no longer credible as a personal supernatural being. Even though I hold those beliefs, I am still a proud minister, but I don't appreciate being told that I'm not truly a Christian. And that's fascinating to me. I don't want to be hypercritical or anything like that, but to have a pastor say that whatever definition of God you have is fine, obviously he's excluding a biblical definition of God because he says God is no longer credible as a personal supernatural being, which is how the Bible reveals him. So what Pastor John is saying is whatever definition you have of God, as long as it's not a biblical definition, it's fine, come to my church, but don't tell me I'm not a Christian, which is weird. Why hang on to the label Christian if you're going to completely trample it under your feet? Laricia Hawkins, uh, I, may, I may not be pronouncing her name correctly, but she was a uh, professor at Wheaton College, which is an evangelical, or at least was, evangelical Bible-believing college in Chicago. She posted something a I think this was about three, four years ago. She said, I stand in religious solidarity with Muslims because they, like me, a Christian, are people of the book. And as Pope Francis stated last week, we worship the same God. Now, when she said that, at least two Wheaton College professors commented on her post and expressed support for her statement that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. New Testament professor Jean Green said, whom did Jesus identify with and stand with? Those whom the rest rejected. Thanks, Laricia. And uh, another communication professor agreed with it and said, absolutely, you go, girl. Now, l listen, I, this is not me saying something against Islam or anything like that. But to say that the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran are the same is insulting to Christians and Islamic people, and it's categorically untrue because both books contradict each other's depictions of God. So yeah, give your life to take the good news to the Islamic people. Sacrifice for them, honor them, love them, serve them, love them sacrificially, pray for them. Do not treat them as enemies, but go to them with the good news that they deserve no less than we did. But don't lie to them But by telling them that they serve the same God as the one true God of the Bible. Don't dishonor them that way. That is, as I said, it's an affront to the word of God and it's an affront to the Quran. To tell Muslims that their God is the God of the Bible is the ultimate act of unlovingness if Jesus Christ is indeed the one way to get to heaven. Now, there were a couple of comments on Professor Hawkins' post that got a ton of likes. One of them said, As a Muslim, I pray to Allah. My faith is the continuation of the faith once revealed to Moses and then to Jesus. Allah is the God that Christians recognize as the Father and Jews as Yahweh. The Muslims worship the same God as that of the Jews and the Christians. We believe that the Jews and the Christians are the people of the book. Which, actually, Muslims really don't believe that. Uh, and certainly Christians don't believe that, and Jewish people don't believe that. 
Uh, another comment that got a lot of likes on this Facebook post by Professor Hawkins was by a pastor named David Lee, and he said, Love without action is no love at all. Those who p- oppose Professor Hawkins, including our alma mater, Wheaton College, join with ISIL or ISIS in promoting enmity instead of peace between our faith communities both of which suffer violence and abuse because of ignorance and intolerance. In this, they hand another victory to terror. So what Pastor David Lee is saying is that if you disagree with Professor Hawking, you are um, you are on the side of ISIS or ISIL, and you are on the side of terror, and you are handing another victory to terror. So, that raises a very important philosophical question. Is Muhammad the way to heaven? Or is Jesus the way to heaven? Will good Islamic people or good people from other religions or whatever go to heaven by trusting in Muhammad or whatever God they trust? Or is Jesus the only way to heaven? So let's see what the Bible says and see if there's any wiggle room there, I guess is a good way of putting it. Let's start out in Acts chapter 4, verse 4. This is an incident where uh, the disciples are teaching about Jesus, and it says this, Now as they were speaking to the people, the priests, the commander of the temple police, and the Sadducees confronted them because they were provoked that they were teaching the people and proclaiming the resurrection from the dead using Jesus as the example. So they seized them and put them in custody until the next day since it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all the members of the high priestly family. After they had Peter and John stand before them, they asked the question, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed— Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people, and we must be saved by it. I'm going to read Acts 4.12 again. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people, and we must be saved by it. Now, that would seem to rule out every other name and every other person but the name of Jesus. Isaiah 44, going back to the Old Testament, we see this. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let them foretell what to come, what is what will come. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. What about 1 Timothy 2, 5, where Paul writes, "There There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. So how many mediators between God and man, Paul? Just the one, right? What about John 3.36? Whoever believes in the Son, this is Jesus speaking, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Or John 3.18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in in him is condemned already because he, he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So we see that here that both Jesus and the rest of the Word of God make exclusive claims to salvation that are unmistakable and yet obviously quite offensive to the modern hearer who bristles at claims of exclusivity. Um, so, so here's the thing, and I don't want to put too fine a point on this, but it is a very logical conclusion. If Jesus says he's the only way to heaven and there are other ways to heaven, then we call that a lie. 
And going back to uh, the trilemma of C.S. Lewis, if Jesus claims he is the way of salvation, the only way of salvation, and there are some other ways of salvation, well, that doesn't make him Lord, that makes him a liar. And it is really beyond question that Jesus claimed to be the only way to heaven. And I, I'm honestly, if I could say it this way, I'm honestly far better with somebody utterly rejecting that claim of Jesus and saying, oh, that's not true. He's not the only way to heaven. Then I am saying, then I am with somebody like Professor Hawkins or uh, other people just absolutely rewording what Jesus said and putting words in his mouth. It doesn't seem fair to, um, totally twist and distort what somebody said, I can understand if you reject it. If Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, though no one comes to the Father except by me, and you say, no, I don't believe that. Well, that's one thing. But if he says that, and you say, you know what, Jesus, Muhammad, whoever, they're all the same. They're all the same way to get up the mountain. That's frustrating because Again, the Quran would strongly disagree with that. The Bible would strongly disagree with that, as we've just seen in, in several passages. And it, it's, it's, it is a dangerous thing to do. It, it's like speaking out of both sides of your mouth. It's a very strange thing. Well, Pastor Tim Keller discusses this dynamic in one of his messages. He says, one of the things people say is that it's arrogant to say Jesus is the supreme savior, the only way. But here we see in Acts 4.12 that salvation is found in no one else, for there is no name, no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And people says, People say, look, you can't do that anymore. You can't say that anymore, Christians. You can believe in Jesus. Great. Just don't say he's the only way or the best way or the superior way to find God. Don't say he's better than the other great teachers and other great leaders like Plato or Moses or Muhammad or Buddha or Gandhi. You can believe in Jesus. No problem. Just don't believe he's better than or superior to any of these other great religious founders or teachers. And Keller says, I always say, wait, I can believe in Jesus. Do you mean the Jesus who said before Abraham was, I already existed? Do you mean the Jesus who said, I'm going to heaven, but when I come back, I'm going to destroy all death and evil and suffering in the world? Do you mean the Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to the Father but my me? Because that's the only Jesus we have in history. And here's what you have to realize. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Now, that may sound arrogant, but the fact is that Jesus himself said that. And because he said that, and no other religious founder said it, no other religious founder claimed to work at that level. Therefore, there's no way to just believe in Jesus as if he's the same as others. A perfect example and a poignant example to me, says Keller, is Toyohiko Kagawa, a great Japanese Christian leader of a couple of generations ago, who tells the story of his conversion like this. Kagawa says something like this, I am grateful for Shinto, Shinto, for Buddhism, for Confucianism. I owe much to these faiths, yet they could not meet me at the moment of my heart's deepest needs. I was a pilgrim journeying on a long road that had no turning. I was weary. I was footsore. I wandered through a dark and dismal world where tragedies were thick. Buddhism teaches great compassion, but since the beginning of time, who has ever said, this is my blood of the covenant, covenant which is poured out for many unto remission of sin? Do you hear that? He says, I learned a lot from Buddhism. But Buddha never said, my blood has been poured out to cleanse you from sin, to put you right with God. Buddha didn't say anything like that. Confucius never said anything like that. Muhammad never said anything like that. See, these other people never made claims like that. They could say, follow my teaching, do this, here's the way to God, but nobody came down to this level, is what Kagawa was saying. Nobody met me at that level. Well, those are words to ponder and to consider and to realize that Jesus made claims clearly of exclusivity. The apostles made claims of exclusivity, and I believe those claims are at the very core of the Christian faith. Well, let's continue reading in Second Chronicles 29, verse 1. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, 
daughter of Zechariah, he did what was right in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the Lord's temple and repaired them. Then he brought in priests and Levites and gathered them in the eastern public square. He said to them, Hear me, Levites, consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove everything impure from the holy place. For our ancestors were unfaithful and did what is evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They abandoned him, turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place, and turned their backs on him. They also closed the doors of the portico, extinguished the lamps, did not burn incense, and did not offer burnt offerings in the holy place of the God of Israel. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was on Judah and Jerusalem, and he made them an object of terror, horror, and mockery, as you see with your own eyes. Our fathers fell by the sword, and our sons, our daughters, and our wives are in captivity because of this. It is in my heart now to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his burning anger may turn away from us. My sons, don't be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to serve him, and to be his ministers and burners of incense. Then the Levites stood up, Mahath, son of Amasai, and Joel, son of Azariah, from the Kohathites, Kish, son of Abdi, and Azariah, son of Jehalalel, from the Merarites, Joah, son of Zima, and Eden, son of Joah, from the Gershonites, Shimri, and Jael, from the Elazaphanites, Zechariah, and Madaniah, from the Asaphites, Jehiel, and Shimei from the Hemanites, Shemaiah, and Utziel, from the Jeduthanites. They gathered their brothers together, consecrated themselves, and went according to the king's command by the words of the Lord to cleanse the Lord's temple. The priests went to the entrance of the Lord's temple to cleanse it. They took all of the unclean things they found in the Lord's sanctuary to the courtyard of the Lord's temple. Then the Levites received them and took them outside to the Kidron Valley. They began the consecration on the first day of the first month, and on the eighth day of the month, They came to the portico of the Lord's temple. They consecrated the Lord's temple for eight days, and on the sixteenth day of the first month they finished. Then they went inside to King Hezekiah and said, We have cleansed the whole temple of the Lord, the altar of burnt offering, and all its utensils, and the table for the rose of the bread of presents, and all its utensils. We have set up and consecrated all the utensils that King Ahaz rejected during his reign. When he became unfaithful, they are in front of the altar of the Lord. King Hezekiah got up early, gathered the city officials, and went to the Lord's temple. They brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, and seven male goats as a sin offering for the kingdom, for the sanctuary, and for Judah. Then he told the descendants of Aaron, the priests, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. So they slaughtered the bulls, and the priests received the blood and splattered it on the altar. They slaughtered the rams and splattered the blood on the altar. They slaughtered the lambs and splattered the blood on the altar. Then they brought the goats for the sin offering, Right into the presence of the king and the congregation who laid their hands on them, the priests slaughtered the goats and put their blood on the altar for a sin offering to make atonement for all Israel. For the king said that the burnt offering and sin offering were for all of Israel. Hezekiah stationed the Levites in the Lord's temple with cymbals, harps, and lyres, according to the command of David. Gad, the king's seer, and the prophet Nathan, for the command was from the Lord through his prophets. The Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah ordered that the burnt offering be offered on the altar. When the burnt offerings began, the song of the Lord and the trumpets began, accompanied by the instruments of King David of Israel. The whole assembly was worshiping, singing the song, and blowing the trumpets. All this continued until the burnt offering was completed. When the burnt offerings were completed, the king and all those present with him bowed down in worship. Then King Hezekiah and the officials told the Levites to sing praise to the Lord in the words of David and of the seer Asaph. So they sang praises with rejoicing and knelt low and worshipped. And Hezekiah concluded, Now you are consecrated to the Lord. Come near and bring sacrifices and thanksgiving offerings to the Lord's temple. So the congregation brought sacrifices and thanksgiving offerings, and all those with willing hearts brought burnt offerings. The number of burnt offerings this congregation brought was 70 bulls, 100 rams, and 200 lambs. All these were for a burnt offering to the Lord. 600 bulls and 3,000 sheep and goats were consecrated. However, since there were not enough priests, they weren't able to skin all of the burnt offerings, so their Levite brothers helped them until the work was finished and until the priests consecrated themselves, for the Levites were more conscientious to consecrate themselves than the priests were. Furthermore, the burnt offerings were abundant, along with the fat of the fellowship offerings and with the drink offerings for the burnt offering. So the service of the Lord's temple was established. Then Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced over how God had prepared the people, for it had come about suddenly. 
Zechariah 11 verse 1, Open your gates, Lebanon, and fire will consume your cedars. Wail, Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen. The glorious trees are destroyed. Wail, oaks of Bashan, for the stately forest has fallen. Listen to the wail of the shepherds, for their glory is destroyed. Listen to the roar of young lions, for the thickets of the Jordan are destroyed. The Lord my God says this, Shepherd the flock intended for slaughter. Those who buy them slaughter them, but are not punished. Those who sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, because I have become rich. Even their own shepherds have no compassion for them. Indeed, I will no longer have compassion on the inhabitants of the land. This is the Lord's declaration. Instead, I will turn everyone over to his neighbor and his king. They will devastate the land, and I will not rescue it from their hand. So I shepherded the flock intended for slaughter, the oppressed of the flock. I took two staffs, calling one favor and the other union, and I shepherded the flock. In one month, I got rid of three shepherds. I became impatient with them, and they also detested me. Then I said, I will no longer shepherd you. Let what is dying die, and let what is perishing perish. Let the rest devour each other's flesh. Next, I took my staff called Favor and cut it in two, annulling the covenant I had made with all the peoples. It was annulled on that day, and so the oppressed of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Then I said to them, If it seems right to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. So they weighed my wages, thirty pieces of silver. Throw it to the potter, the Lord said to me. This magnificent price I was valued by them. So I took the thirty pieces of silver and threw it it into the house of the Lord to the potter. Then I cut in two my second staff, union, annulling the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. The Lord also said to me, take the equipment of a foolish shepherd. I am about to raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are perishing And he will not seek the lost or heal the broken. He will not sustain the healthy, but he will devour the flesh of the fat sheep and tear off their hooves. Woe to the worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May a sword strike his arm in his right eye. May his arm wither away and his right eye go completely blind. Revelation chapter 15 verse 1. Then I saw another great and awe-inspiring sign in heaven. Seven angels with the seven last plagues, for with them God's wrath will be completed. I also saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had won the victory over the beast, its image and the number of its name, were standing on the sea of glass with harps from God. They sang the song of God's servant Moses and the song of the Lamb. Great and awe-inspiring are your works, Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name, for you alone are holy, All the nations will come and worship before you, because your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and the heavenly temple, the tabernacle of testimony, was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues, dressed in pure bright linen with golden sashes wrapped around their chests. One of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bulls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Then the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Amen. Well, friends, no matter what you're going through right now, may the good Lord bless you. May he shepherd you. May he walk beside you and show you his great grace and mercy. Good day to you and Godspeed.